Our topic this week from the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 10 and 11, Peleg, the dividing of the earth and the Tower of Babel. How many know who Peleg is? Soccer player, right? No. No. Peg leg? Five pirate? Anyone else know? No one else knows? No one knows who Peg leg is? He has a very important part to play in the Bible. We're going to see this right here tonight. He's got the title role here in this week's sermon. All right, so let's take a look. We'll get educated a little bit about Peleg. All right, Genesis chapter 10, verse 1. This is the genealogies of the son, the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So we're going to go through the genealogies. All right, this is why you missed it because you went to sleep during genealogy class, right? And every other class. <laughs> Verse two: the sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, and a whole list of sons that he had. And the sons of Gomer were so these are the grandsons now of Noah, and a whole list of them. And from these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to their language, according to their families, and into their nations. Now it says coastland peoples of the Gentiles. Just now, it, not all Bible translates, translates goyim here. That's the word goyim in this sentence as Gentiles. Some just as nations, some as peoples, depending on the version. But goyim... Uh, is often translated as Gentiles. And, uh, and that's what it literally means is nations, right? So Israel is a goy as well. Israel is a nation as well. So it's not like Israel and the goyim, Israel and the Gentiles. Uh, Israel is a nation. But when a person from Israel, whether a prophet, is writing and saying about the nations, Obviously, he's not referring to their nation, or they're referring to their nation and the other nations. Right? Like if you're here in the United States and you say, wow, the economy here is absolutely horrible, and, and someone else says, yes, but in all the other nations, it's horrible right now as well, right? right? So they're talking about the other nations, you know, not counting us because we're standing here, right? They're talking about those other nations, right? Uh, whether that includes us or doesn't include us, depending on how the sentence is going, but when you're Talking about your house and all the houses in the neighborhood, right? So, you, you know, that's uh, just a reference term. And so that's how it's used, right? So it's just a nation. It means nations. And so if someone's referring, again, the prophet, to the other nations, they use that word, the goyim, right? Nations, right? Or if it's talking about a specific nation, uh, that nation, the goy, the gentile, uh, goyim, gentiles, plural. Uh, and so that's how that term, it's not like two separate groups or the groups, a good group, bad group. Sometimes that's how people look at it and some people get offended. You know, this term Gentile or, you know, goyim is a bad term. It's not necessarily a bad term, it just means nations. Right? That's, all, that's all it literally means. Um, okay, verse 6. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush were Cush, begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel in the land of Shinar, Shinar and, that land, and from that land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh. So, uh, so we have some of the names being listed here, the sons of Ham. So Nimrod uh, becomes this mighty hunter on the earth. And what exactly that means? Well, I don't know, maybe he had trophies, you know, had these uh, stuffed uh, heads of animals on his wall, or, or what is that, maybe, my, my, you know, mighty warrior, or you know, fighter, or hunter, or whatever. He was hunting with humans, or whatever. But he became very powerful. He built two cities, two cities that existed for a long, long time. Right? Babel had a big influence. Babylon becomes Babylon. And Nineveh, which again extends for a long, long period of time. So, I mean, it's pretty some, uh, amazing for one person to build a city that becomes a notoriety. He built two cities. And I say he was a powerful, influential uh, person. Now, it says before the Lord. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean he served the Lord, right? Or it might be before. In other words, he put himself before the Lord. Right? It was all about him, not about God, but he thought of himself. He was mighty and built these uh, you know, huge cities uh, in reference to himself, for himself, uh, to give himself a name and fame and notoriety 
and, uh, and so he put himself before God, uh, thought of himself higher than God. And then it continues with the children of Ham and the, the descendants of Ham in uh, Genesis 10, verse 13. Mizarim from Ham begot uh, this other group, whatever from whom became the Philistines and this other group, and, and Canaan was also from Ham, and they beget the Sidon, and his firstborn was Heth, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and the Gergesites, and the Termites, and the Antisemites, <laughs> You know, there's all kinds of uh, ites there coming on, right? <laughs> Parasites, right? All kinds of things there. Um, and everywhere the families of Canaan were dispersed. Now we see here, uh, from the children of Ham, not a lot of great names there, right? Actually, a lot of uh, notorious names. Right? We had Nimrod, and then you got the Philistines, and, and the Jebusites, and the Ammonites, all anti-Semites, enemies of, of the Jewish people. And, uh, and it's from them. They all came from Ham, uh, the Canaanites as well. And that's why we don't eat pork. You think about that one. You'll get it here in a minute. Okay. <laughs> I'm hamming it up. That's right. <laughs> okay, verse 19. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon as you go toward uh, Gear, Gear, as far as Gaza, and then you go toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adama and Zebulun and uh, 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 Zebulun, Zebulim, as far as Lachish. And so some of those names uh, are still known today. God is still known today. Uh, and so some of those borders, Sodom and Gomorrah, we know where that was. And so really it's outlining what is today uh, Israel, basically, what became uh, the land of Israel. And that's where the Canaanites were. And that's why Abraham goes to the land of Canaan. Right? And that's where it comes from. So uh, one of the... Uh, Descendants of Noah through Ham, and so a grandson of Noah, and we read about him, and the horrible thing that either him or Ham did against Noah uh, last week, and their sin against him, and the curse that Noah pronounced against Canaan and his descendants, that they would be servants. Genesis chapter 10, verse 21, children were born to Shem. The sons of Shem were Arafax, 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 Arafax. He was the father of the duck who sells insurance. Arafax, Arafax, right? Is that right? Like the Arafax. He began Selah, and Selah began Eber, and Eber were born two sons, and the sons, one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Ah, that's interesting. That's what his name means, divided. And so he's a born to Shem. Um, and so it's from Shem that Israel comes, and Shem, the Shemites. Right? So the anti-Shemites, where this comes from, this term. So Shem has these children, and one of the children, a grand grandchildren, child, is Peleg. And so it says, for in his days the earth was divided. Well, what does that mean? The earth was divided in his day. Well, there is a theory that at one point, all the nations were locked together, right? pieces of a puzzle and there's tectonic plates, and that they separated at some point in history. And if you look at uh, the, the, a map of uh, Africa and compare that with South America and, and uh, North America and where the uh, Inter-America is and that the... the, uh, the um, um, Med not the Mediterranean, where we go cruising, <laughs> where Floridians go cruising with it. Caribbean. Caribbean, right, the Caribbean area, then they're right. And you could just fit it right in there, right? So the Africa kind of just fits in, it seems like a puzzle piece, and they just kind of seem to come together, and where Brazil sticks out of South America, kind of fits right into the, the belly there of, uh, of Africa, where that's cut in there, and seems to kind of fit together. You can kind of visualize that even today, uh, about thousands of years after uh, they separated. And you have the, the, uh, the rift there in the middle of the ocean, the, the, the volcanoes there, and, and the trenches, and the plates shifting apart, separating apart. So there were, there were scientists, not necessarily biblical scientists, but scientists who believed they were all together at one time, and that they drifted apart, were separated apart. Well, this very well could be what the Bible is referencing here. It doesn't say the people were divided, it says the earth was divided 
in his day. Now, wouldn't that be interesting if that's what God was referring to? Because how long has it been since they knew about tectonic plates and, and the separating? I mean, you know, it, you go back uh, just a few hundred years and, and, and Europeans didn't even know about North America. And those are North, what become now North America or South America didn't even know about Europeans or what's now Africa or, or Asia, right? They were all separated apart. So this whole even theory to even have aerial photos that you can look down at the map and see it together or that they can go underwater and, and see the, the, the plates and know about the, the, the volcanoes down there. So it's all really pretty modern understanding of the earth and the structure of the earth. And yet if that's what God was referring to, he mentioned it thousands of years before even a whole theory of the plates being together and then separating even came to pass. And I think that's pretty interesting, especially as we see it in light of the very next chapter, which we'll get to in just another couple of minutes here. So verse, uh, well, yeah, chapter 11, verse 10, says this is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begat Arafaxad two years after the flood. So we know exactly when he was born in relation to the flood, in relation to when Noah was born, and Noah, we know when Noah was born in relation to, all the way back to Adam. So we have these dates here. And after he, uh, he begat Arafax, uh, Sam, uh, Hashem lived another 500 years and begat sons and daughters. And he lived 35 years and begat another guy. And after he begat uh, Selah and lived another 403 years and begat, right, and begat, and begat daughters, sons and daughters. He lived another 30 years, begat Eber, and begets another one, 403 years. We got sons and daughters, and Eber lived 34 years and begat Peleg. Right? So all that, you look at the yellows, and we're only talking 101 years. Really, well, it's two years after the flood, so I had another two years. Right? 103 years after the flood, when Peleg is born, and his parents name him Peleg, divided, because that is when the earth was divided. So only 103 years after the flood, whatever this is, the earth was divided 103 years after the flood. What could that mean? Let's keep going. Verse 17, after Peleg, uh, Eber lived 430 years and he begat sons and daughters and Peleg lived 30 years and begat Reu. And after he begat Reu, Peleg lived 209, and begat sons and daughters. And in chapter, Genesis chapter 10, verse 32, these were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations and in their nations. And from these, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. I don't say right after the flood, but sometime after the flood, this genealogy that it just gave us, that this is where all the nations of the earth come from, and that the nations were divided on the earth, which we just read, the earth was divided. And so these nations might have been on these plates, and then the plates were divided, putting people on all these different continents. So there weren't necessarily people crossing, you know, from uh, what's now Alaska over straight into Russia. But if they were already on those plates, when those plates moved, that's kind of how it seems to be reading here. The earth was divided, and the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. So again, when maybe did that take place other than the year, 103 years after the flood? Is there something else bringing this even all together even more? Well, let's keep reading. Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. The whole earth had one language and one speech. And as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Sinar, Shinar, and they dwelt there, and they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks. For they had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So these people are coming together. They've been all of one language. And they are together and they journey to this area from uh, Mount Arafat where the 
arc was, and finally they decide to come down to the valley, they come down to the plains, and they say, let's make this tower for ourselves, a name for ourselves, so that we don't get scattered abroad. Right? So that's their fear. They don't want to get scattered abroad. They want to stick together. And yet, what did God tell them? Populate the earth. And yet, in opposition to what God said, they wanted to congregate together. Build huge cities in certain areas. Cluster together. Why? To make a name for themselves. Let us, and he uses that phrase here, let us, a few times here. Now, if it says let us, what does that mean? Let us. A group, right? More than one, right? You can't have us when you, an individual, one person can't have an us, right? Yeah, yeah. us means plural, right? So the, a group of them. Now, Noah lived 350 years after the flood. So when Peleg was born, Noah was still alive. Noah was still alive for another 250 years or so after the earth was divided. And Shem was also alive. I think Shem lived another 500 years after the flood. And so uh, they were there as witnesses, and witnesses, no doubt, during this occasion here as well. And so we had these group of let's us, but then you, I believe you still have Noah, faithful Noah, probably Shem and others who are faithful who don't go down there, don't want to build this tower, don't want to build this city, who want to remain faithful to God, and we have this separating taking place between those who are serving God and those who want to serve themselves. Build a name for themselves. Mighty people before the Lord. And Nimrod would have been part of this because this is where they're building Babel. So they're building this tower whose top is in the heavens, why would you want to build a tower so high that it's up into the heavens? Be like God, notoriety, seen from far away. To be closer to God, to have a conversation with him, not necessarily to worship him. And just in case there's another flood, we'll have a place to go that the waters won't be able to reach that high. So in opposition to God, even though they still got the rainbow of promise, even though Noah is still alive and Shem is still alive, they are in resistance, denial, and disobedience against God. Defiant against him. Standing before him. Wanting to make a name for themselves. Build up all about them. Not about God's name, not about exalting him, but about exalting self, being known, fame, power, influence, control, keeping everyone together, we can control everyone over everything, mighty power over the earth. Verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built, and the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So God sees this and God is not pleased. Obviously they're not wanting to worship him. They're wanting to be in defiance of him. And God said, this is not according to the plan that I laid out for them. He is not happy. And so they're united, but they're in united in opposition to God. And so God, in verse 7 there, says, come, let us go down. Now, what does that mean? God's saying, let us go down? What does that mean, us? The, plur the plurality of the God family, right? And if you missed that, you can go all the way back to our beginning in Genesis. Uh, Elohim, God let God Created in the beginning, God, God created, and we go over that term, God, what is God used there, the phrase that's used, Elohim, plural term. And then several times already in Genesis, we've seen, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And after they ate from the tree, they have become like us. 
And so we have this plural term, this us term here, plenty of times, several times here, in, we're just ch still generally, this is chapter 11, and already three or four times in the scriptures, this plurality theme of God. And so God goes down to confuse their language so that they won't be able to understand each other. Verse 9, the Lord, the Lord confused the language of all the people of the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. And they ceased building the city, therefore its name is called Babel. And Babel, where we get the term like a babbling brook, or, or uh, uh, making just babbling sounds, right? Who makes, what type of people make babbling sounds? Babies, that's right. And that's where we get the word from. Baby comes, the word baby comes from uh, Latin or whatever, Greek maybe, whatever. <laughs> uh, too many languages as far as I'm concerned. But whatever the case it goes, babble, babel, baby comes because they babble. And so it comes from this term, this phrase. And so they were babbling. It seemed like they were babbling. Different languages. And they end up becoming scattered over broad over the face of the earth. And what did they fear? being scattered over the face of the earth. And yet that is what ended up happening. Fears came back to haunt them as they were in opposition. Now they could have spread out over the face of the earth, and that's different than being scattered over the face of the earth, but in their disobedience and rebellion, they end up being scattered over the face of the earth, which wasn't God's original plan. God's original plan was to spread over the face of the earth. So they end up having to be scattered and, uh, so because of the different languages. And I remember this story being told when I was in Hebrew school, young lad, uh, maybe one of the only things I remember for some reason. Uh, but I remember the, the teacher telling us that uh, so they, they were building this big tower and the languages were confused and they didn't understand each other. And so it was lunchtime and the guy called down for a lunch, bring up his uh, a sandwich for him, and they sent up some bricks and he says, what's this? I can't eat this. And so he throws it down to the guys down below. You know, there's just total, total chaos ends up taking place because they don't understand each other. They, they ask for tools, they're getting the right tools. It's all confusion, and that's what Babylon is, a state of confusion. And so they became confused. They didn't understand each other. And so eventually some realized that they understood each other, and they grouped over here, and another group grouped over here, and understood each other's language, and they ended up becoming groups, and then they scattered over the earth. And then after they scattered over to the different parts of the earth, if after they had scattered over the face of the earth, God then decides to divide the earth and sends one group across the, built the uh, Atlantic and sends off a group going that way, and another group going off to Australia, and another group going off... Uh, this area, New Zealand, and separating various different continents, not only would he separate people because of different language barriers, but physically separate people from being able to come again together in defiance against him. Now, why would he do that? Why would God want to separate them that way? Especially if he does the land mass and separate them on different land masses. Because evil would get together in large mass of people, and it's a way of so, separating them from getting together. So why would God do that? Like God would, didn't want the evil to accept them and come together in evil again, so why would he do that? Dispensing power. Okay, it's dispersing power, so why would God want to keep power from coming together in one way and uniting together in an evil power source? Why would he want that? He loved them, that's right, he loved them, <laughs> and he was giving them another opportunity he had just destroyed all the earth. He didn't want to have to destroy it all again right away. It's only 103 years since the flood. And so if I separate them into different groups, instead of all that peer pressure in one area and a small group of evil people controlling it and, 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 and giving the message down, now they're all scattered abroad and the Holy Spirit can speak to the different groups and individuals within the group. And you don't have as much peer pressure in smaller groups scattered over different nations all over the place in their own different languages, and there's a much better chance of a person hearing the Holy Spirit speak through the fog when it's just them and their 
little group and their little tribe and their little nation here and there and scattered there, as opposed to big masses of mob mentality taking place. And so God in his love gave them more opportunities to come to him. As eventually we'll find out, not this week, but in a few future weeks, Abraham does hear God's call. And so these others had that opportunity to hear God's call as well upon their souls. And you think about that separation, if that's how it takes place, and we have a few just lines here, he separates just chapter next to chapter, separates their languages, divides the people, divides the nations, divides the earth. So if he separated them onto the different land masses and then sent those different land masses floating apart, then we go thousands of years before Columbus decides to get in a boat and cross the Atlantic, and people on both sides of the Atlantic then get to communicate with each other for the first time in literally thousands of years. There's some separating going on. Again, Australia and other islands and various different places, they're really isolated. It wasn't until the very end of time here, relatively, where God has began to bring people back together again and what do we see them doing? Globalism. Globalism. One world order. One world religion pushing, right? All these various different things to push towards a, a unity against God. And so in his mercy, he separated people physically as well as language-wise for thousands of years so that he could speak to them individually. Do you think that's when race came in? It very well could be when the races were changed as well. That's right. Another way of dividing people right, and separating people on various different lines. Yes, that very well would fit with that too. We don't have a Bible verse that kind of says that, but, but we do have a Bible verse that says the earth was divided and that the nations were divided and that the people were scattered over the earth. So we do have those things. We have languages, nations separating, and physical bodies separating all in the Bible, and we see that. In geology, we see that in the earth. So what was God's response to this? God separated them, confused the languages because they were in opposition to him. What does God do when we are in unity with him? Well, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Shavuot had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to, on them diff, divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And as they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so here they're united together, but not united against God, not before God, but united under God, behind God, following God, in submission to God, united together, one in heart and mind and soul and spirit. And God pours out his spirit, and he does just the opposite of what he did with Babel, giving them the ability to understand and speak in different languages. Miracle of God. And so the Holy Spirit began poured out and began to speak with other languages. Now, some versions use the word tongues there. When it says tongues in the Bible, it's talking languages, right? That's, the, you know, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, right? So talking languages, you know, might, don't use that term that often, tongue anymore, but it wasn't a whole bunch of tongues laying down on the ground. You know, it's languages that he's talking about, right? Um, native tongue, native language, right? They began to speak in languages of the other nations, of the Gentiles, all the nations, right? That they were able to speak. And then they're listed here. They were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation. Goyim, if it was Hebrew, it's not. But if it was Hebrew, it would be Goyim. Uh, under heaven, and of the Gentiles, every nation. And they were sound occurred, and the multitude came together, and they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not these who speak Galileans? How is it we hear each in our own language in which we were born? 
our native tongue when we were born. Now, they might be able to understand some Hebrew. Obviously, they came to Israel. They came to Jerusalem for Shavuot. But they're from all these different nations. And yeah, hearing it in a second tongue, it's not the same as hearing it in your native. Right? And so they're able to hear the gospel presented to them, the power of God, the love of God in their own native language, to really grasp it, to really understand it, and then to be able to take it back to their nations and share it with others, not as trying to translate what they said and then maybe mess up some words there, but able to take it back because they heard it in the tongue, in the language of what they're going back to speak it in. Because God's wanting to spread his word and bring people together in unity in his truth and holiness. So we're seeing just the opposite taking place here. God's spirit is poured out. And then it lists some of these places. Genesis, Acts chapter 2, verse 9. Parthians and Medes and Alamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judah and Cap Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya. You can see language is not my first uh, forte, right? You know, it, adjoining Syria and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Uh, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speak in our own tongue the wonderful works of God. Isn't that powerful? The love of God. Again, the love of God to get the gospel out to reach everybody in our own way, in our own understanding. And so there's a whole list here. What is it? Like 16 or so different people groups mentioned there that God is reaching out to take the gospel to, to spread the gospel and to undo the rebellion, and to take the gospel to the then known world and let it permeate as much as possible to those that they were able to reach. And then, again, another 1,500 years or so after that, then take it across the oceans to reach other people. That was God's plan, to be able to reach the world. But unfortunately, as the world is now coming together, with different ways to understand each other, and the language barrier is coming down, and the uh, distance barriers are coming down, because we can fly really fast. Again, it's fairly recent ability to do that, fly very fast, to go places in within a day all across the world, and be able to understand each other, and even just on your phone, your phone can translate for you. And instead of coming together in the gospel, instead of coming together in God's truth, what's happening? Power is being consolidated among a few. Wealth is being consolidated among a few. And they're using that for evil, to make a name for themselves, to build towers after themselves, and to exalt themselves, and control, and manipulate, and pile people into cities, Compact them and all speaking the same voice, the same language. It might not be the same physical language, but saying the same thing. When newscaster after newscaster after newscaster, no matter where they are, say the same exact phrase over and over again, it was fed to them from some bot somewhere. Right? Some computer gave them out there, and now they got these bots that will just take over and write paragraphs and stories and just send it out there. They don't even need a person writing anymore. Respond to articles and news feeds and just tweets and just a computer sending it out and saying whatever they want, but whoever's controlling it, putting in the phrases and the thinking that they want and the slant that they want, it just spits it out and spits it out and spits it out. And the other forms, the mediums, that are used, computers and phones and televisions, satellites to get all the masses thinking together. Isn't it interesting, and we've seen over the last few years here, three years or so, all this thinking coming together of nation, national leaders. National leaders who don't agree on anything. They can't vote anything 100% in the UN, except against Israel, that's pretty close to 100%. But, uh, we can't get together on anything and yet come together when they're told this is what you got to do. And then we saw over the last three years this unity taking place 
and all speaking basically with one voice, all coming together, throwing their finances all into one place, all obeying certain companies, and companies too. Major companies with all different kinds of boards and companies across the spectrum that would seem to be in opposition to each other, all coming together and all supporting the same organizations, all throwing their money to the same organizations, all spouting the same things, all having commercials saying the same thing, promoting the same thing. Not, so even, not even promoting their product anymore, they're promoting an ideology more than a product. The product is a secondary thing. So who's giving them money to promote this ideology over their product and just using their product as a selling point of their ideology? And they're pushing and they're pushing and pushing and it's coming together and God's not in it. God's not in there thinking, God's not in there, not always so much in open opposition to God, but certainly in open opposition to God's principles, the Bible and God's truth, God's lifestyle. God's directions on how we should live, and what is right and what is wrong, what is just and what is good. And we have this control going on. We have Babylon taking place all over again. And isn't that what Revelation predicted 2,000 years ago? Called last day events, called it Babylon. Isn't that interesting? How would he know 2,000 years ago, John right in there on some island, to call it that the nations, the languages, would come together in unity together and speak confusion to the people. Right. You're looking with your eyes and they're telling you just the opposite of what you're seeing. Exactly. Total confusion. Gaslighting us left and right. Guess if you're not familiar with that term, it was a book or a story or a movie or something like that where his husband wanted to drive his wife crazy and, and so he had this... That was a movie? Okay, I don't know. I just know the story, but <laughs> and there's light, and you just turn the light down a little bit, the flame on the light, and she's coming, isn't it dark? No, it's bright as anything. No, it must be me. You turn the light down the next day, and the light, no, it, it must be me. Because you're thinking, she does what she's doing. I said, what do you mean? Is everything's great. Can't you see it? And it's totally the opposite of reality. And all again, all across the nations, all the speakers, all the media personality, all the newscasters, all the sports figures, all those with a voice, all the Hollywood producers and actors acting out, all the political actors, all saying the same thing over and over again. We have this unity taking place. And I have no doubt right now it's kind of in opposition to God and not a direct op opposition in theory and in um, practice. The Bible calls Babylon, refers to Babylon. Babylon was a religious area. They believed in God. Not the God, <laughs> but gods. They had their gods. And this has their gods as well. Gods of this world. The things of this world. The Bible predicts a form of godliness. They'll take on a form of godliness but denying the true power thereof, the Holy Spirit, to transform hearts. I'm not expecting atheism to be their push. Because all the world is going to wander after the beast. And not only wander after the beast, all the world is going to worship the beast. And to worship the beast, it has to have a religious character to it. There's a worship aspect there. So bringing all the world together in this worship together, and they have all the voices all saying the same thing, all the technocrats all spreading the same message and silencing and censoring all opposition voices. Babylon all over again, building up this tower to themselves, making a name for themselves in opposition to God. And then God will, as he did then, he will step in again. And our jo job is to unite together as in Acts 2, setting aside our opposition to one another, setting aside our petty uh, grievances and self-exalted positions and our own little towers of our thoughts and our theories and our opinions and 
our name and our self and our grievances and our hurt feelings and setting them aside. And our animosity towards one another, prejudices against one another. And prejudice doesn't have to be against racists, right? You, know, they try and, you can be prejudiced against someone who's your, your brother, your twin, you know, and still have an odd against them and not like him for whatever reason. Right? A bias, yeah, bias against someone. Yeah. Put away the biases and be filled with God's love. And that only takes the Spirit of God. Because naturally, how are we naturally? Carnal. Our natural heart is self. We are naturally enmity against God. And so we need to surrender that to the Lord and be cleansed through his power, through his sacrifice, through the sacrifice of the Messiah. Receive his forgiveness, receive his cleansing to change us so that we don't unite with the, the majority, don't unite with the masses, but that we follow the Lord. And that only takes, comes about by surrender to the Lord, which is a conscious choice and a confession of our sins and our natural nature to be independent of God and independent of others and surrender that and then for God to fill us with his Holy Spirit that gives us love for others and a burden for others and a passion for others and a reaching out for others, concern for them and interceding for them, a praying for them, a checking on them, a communicating with them, a loving them, ministering to one another and not only with just our friends, those within our congregation and our family, but then reaching out to others, to the lost, and loving even our enemies as ourselves, and praying for them and doing good to them, demonstrating God's character and God's love. And that's our job. That's the contrast between Genesis 10 and 11 and Acts chapter 2. And so the world is back in Genesis chapter 11 uh, with Babylon and the power and the tower, but we need to be in Acts chapter 2 of uniting together, coming together in one accord, in one heart, in one mind. No longer who's the greatest. Setting all that aside and surrender to the Lord because only the Lord is great. He is the greatest. In submission under him, and uniting together, arm in arm, brother and brother and sister and sister coming together in the love of the Lord, united together in his word, right? So not unity in sacrificing God's truth, but unity together in God's truth, which still gives us diversity. It's a unity in diversity. It's not a unity in uniformity. That's what the world has. The world has a unity in uniformity where they say all the same thing because they're parrots and tell us what to say forced what to say and how to be, and the dress code that comes through year by year. Right? This is what you show this year. This year you show the bellies. This year you show the shoulders. This year you show, you know, every year the different round of ceremonies of what they tell you to wear, and what they throw out there. So it's kind of a uniform, what to watch, what to think, what to say. But God's unity is diverse, a diversity. We're all different, coming together, and the differences help each other and accent each other and bless each other. And Paul gives the analogy of a body. All different parts of the body, all working together. Feet are not the hand, the hands are not the feet. Feet are not the mouth, the feet does the walking, right? Mouth should do the talking and keep the two apart, right? Working together in harmony together. That's God's body bringing people together. Still with each our unique role, our unique individuality, but coming together and blessing each other and working together with each other, helping one another and accenting one another, making each other better. Right? The hand is not much good without an arm. Right? So the arm and the hand work together. They're two totally different things. But they help each other. And so they work together. That's how God calls us to come together in that type of a unity, that type of unified body, that kind of a unified spirit. And that's his calling upon us. And those are the two parties that are going to be in these last days. Both are going to be united. One united in counterfeit to God, in a false worship of God, 
and those uniting together under God. Which side do we want to be on? Who do we want to be with? Who do we want to live? How is our lives now? Can people tell which side we're on? Can people at work, people in our school, people in our neighborhood, can they tell what side we're on? Or do we eat, live, act, dress, watch, talk about the same thing they do? Is there a difference between God's people and the world? Or are we blended together so much that it's undiscerning? We need to stand out peculiar people following God's ways. God's ways are not man's ways, not the ways of this world. We need to walk under his direction, according to his path, according to his plan, according to his word. And so as we pray together, God is speaking to your heart, maybe some area of confusion that you're in and some kind of Babylon that you're in, some area of the world that you're still living in. Corporately, uniting with the world, God bring his spirit upon you and conviction upon you. Or maybe there's some individual little tower you're building up in your own mind, your own little fiefdom for yourself, whether wealth or notoriety or power struggle or manipulation of others, maybe just in your own little home, maybe whatever little circle you have, still you always have to be in control, manipulating. Or maybe you're easily manipulated and just follow along and go along with the crowd and go along with the surf and just float along and like a balloon and time and time again have been uh, drifting in wrong areas and wrong paths because you've followed wrong voices. Wanted to be part of the majority, wanted to be part of the crowd, wanted to be part of what's popular. Didn't want to stand out. We're afraid of standing out. And drifted along. The blood of Messiah can cleanse us of all the past and current areas in our lives. Third, if you don't have a passion for the lost and a burden for the lost, that's what the Holy Spirit does. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, he gives us a passion and the ability, the gifts to reach other people. That's what we see demonstrated in Acts chapter 2. The gift wasn't just for themselves. The gift was for spreading the gospel. And immediately, that's how it was used. And quickly spread the gospel to those 16 different people groups right there. And then they obviously took it home after the holy day was over. If you don't have a burden for the lost, then you're missing the Holy Spirit. And ask the Lord to cleanse you of the selfishness. Maybe you're just into God for yourself for heaven, for your own benefit. And surrender that, confess that to the Lord. Accept his forgiveness because of the blood of Yeshua and ask him to truly give you the Holy Spirit. True passion for the lost, true passion for others, true burden to help and minister and be used by God in service for him. Or maybe you're not united together. God calls us to come together. So we've had it's coming together, a joining together, bringing his people together. God doesn't want just floating individuals, a hand just floating off by itself. Coming together, the body of God, united together, in unity together, in the family of God. Let us, God is, demonstrates in himself that unity he is one. He comes together, this plural one, this unique oneness. This plural one. That's how God wants us to be one. One team coming together in unity together. But again, it's the name of ourselves, our own, floating around an island of our own, but coming together, pulling together. And if you felt alone, you felt isolated, Ask God to bring you together, bring you into harmony, whether it's something in yourself or something in 
me or the group, the congregation, may God forgive us and cleanse us so that we embrace all and come together in unity together, in oneness together. So if any of those areas apply to you, or maybe some other area God was speaking to your heart and mind about, well, let's pray and let God do his powerful work. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace. We're thankful, Lord, for your word that gives us all these little details and helps us put all these pieces together, helps us to see the past and see the future and know what's at hand as history is repeating itself. We're thankful, Lord, that you're consistent and you're truthful. And you see all things and know all things. And you've given us everything we need to know for life and godliness and salvation. Thank you, Yeshua, for leaving heaven in our behalf and coming for us, and burden for us, and loving us, sacrificing yourself for us. Thank you for cleansing us of our carnal nature. Thank you for carrying it into yourself. We confess our sins and our shortcomings, our selfishness and our pride, our own mightiness, before you, standing before you in opposition to, against you in various different ways. Forgive us for disunity, forgive us for animosity. And being problems and causing problems. Give us a negativity and gossip and all things that separate. Thank you for cleansing us. Forgive us for worldliness. Forgive us for following the ways of the world and the things of the world and being influenced by the world. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your mind and your heart. And live in us and out of us for your honor and glory. Bring us together in unity, together in your truth and your word, under you and in you. May we be one as Yeshua and the Father are one. Make us one one in you and one together, all united together as a family. And use us as individually and as a body in sharing your truth with others around us. Give us your voice, give us your words, give us your language to speak to people's hearts and minds. In Yeshua's holy name, amen.